Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. Humans are weird. Bleep. Written by Betty Adams. But why do speakers produce different sound profiles? Twistunder asked as he examined the earbuds in his grippling appendages. For directionality, Mac Dodge answered without taking his eyes off the screen. It's why most interfaces have two speakers. When, uh, what is directionality? Twistunder asked, pressing the earbuds to his lateral core curiously. Mac paused as he tried to figure out the question. So, I'm watching two-dimensional screen here, he gestured to the screen. Yes, Twistunder said. So the lion deer comes onto the screen from the left. Mac played back the scene here at two minutes five, but you can hear him coming in from thirty seconds before that, right? Twistunder set the earbuds aside and waved his grappling appendages in agreement. So the computer knows to play the sound from the lion deer from the left earbud, so we know where to look, Mac explained, what direction it comes from, so that's the directionality. Twistunder curled all the appendages underneath him and sat there in what must have been a human space called a thinking loaf. So, uh, humans, he finally said, can tell which direction a predator is coming from by sound. Well, yeah, Max said. Can't you? No, Twistunder said simply. Why would we need to do that? We can see where it's coming from. Mac leaned back and examined the perfect radial symmetry of Twistunder's form. You do have 360 vision, Mac agreed, but what happens after dark or when you're in murky water? Remember that we see well into what you call the infrared spectrum, Twistunder reminded him. True blackness or even darkness is very rare for our photoreceptors. Huh, Mac said, so you just don't get much directional information from sound. And you use sound to avoid predation. This doesn't explain some... Uh, if you do not mind me saying so, odd behavior of yours, Twistunder said. Oh, really? Max said, leaning back with a grin. Like what? You wish to know what behaviors we find odd? Twistunder asked carefully, his appendages shifting out in the thinking loaf uneasily. Yep, Max said with a grin. Give it to me. Twistunder gave a low humming noise. You swivel when the pressure alert sounds. Yeah, Mac agreed. It's an annoying beep. You have command names for specific wavelengths of sound dependent on the duration and intensity. Twistunder pointed out, beep, boop, and bleep, Mac said with a grin. That, Twistunder, raising his gripping appendages eagerly, you name sounds. I guess we do, Mac said. What of it? You name specific wave shapes. It's just strange, Twistunder said. Just a little strange. End of story. Story number two. Humans are weird. Petting it. Written by Betty Adams. The setting red sun caught in every branch of the primordial forest and cast its diffused glow on the already red fur of Prince Triclick. He was currently adjourning to the milky white apron so that it sat more easily over his wings. His companion, half his size and several shades lighter, not to mention bearing none of the battle scars that crossed the recrossed Triclick's worn battle flesh, gazed at him with skepticism pouring out of his beady black eyes. You, the flight second said, you are going to be a nurse. Triclick hissed in passive irritation as he pulled out a tin of polish and added a little scented shine to his three remaining sensory horns and ease the ever-present pain in his five stumps. No, he said firmly, I am simply volunteering my off hours to give aid and comfort to allies who have sacrificed so much for our cause. Oh, I would never question how much we owe the humans, the flight second said grimly. Granted, they gained from this campaign, too, but we would have never reclaimed this world without them. So you sound my depth, Triclick said, his voice distorted slightly as he examined his teeth, still needle sharp as though proudly in the reflection of the back of his tin. They call us hellbats, the flight second said bluntly. 
I've seen humans who have been allies for months burst out screaming when a flight breaks from the ground in front of them. We literally... He held up his wing claw for emphasis, resembled nothing so much as a messenger of their underworld. Your point? Triclick asked blandly as he checked the appearance once more. What? The flight second demanded. In the name of the first flight makes you think that the presence of our most feared warrior would offer injured humans any comfort at all. Most likely, they will just sit there in mortal terror and fear of offending you. One would think, Triclick admitted, but that has not been the result observed by the medics. Before the flight second could respond, Triclick licked off the branch they had perched on and flew in a lazy spiral towards a tent on the forest floor marked with a bold red cross. The flight second hissed and followed him. However, there was no chance to begin the conversation again before the fluttering to the stop outside the insect repelling netting. They slipped through the barrier and landed on the massive desk that served as human medics. The one on duty smiled up at him from his paperwork and waved them in. There was only one human in the medical ward today, and the flight second saw. A young human, one of the new batch, he supposed. From the pale tint of his face and the audible gargling from his abdomen, that had been a bedridden for some digestive malady. The flight second grimaced, but Prince Triclick flew fearlessly up to the human and landed on the edge of his bed. As the flight second had expected, the human started violently at the Triclick. Greetings, friend Smithson, Triclick said, dipping his head as he landed. Are you ready to begin your therapy again? To the flight second surprise, the agitation almost immediately left the human's face, and he nodded eagerly. Sure thing, Commander, the human began. Ast! Triclick hissed in remonstrance. Right, right, no ranks here, the human said with a laugh. One mustn't defend the medics, Triclick quoted in all seriousness. Now let's begin. He hopped over and laid himself flat on the blanket that covered the human's knee. The human reached out a hand hesitantly and then gently lowered and stroked the exposed length of fur between Triclick's scarred wings. The flight second watched in astonishment as the human relaxed back against the pillows with a happy sigh as he continued stroking back and forth on the line of the throne. Now where was I? Prince Triclick began when the human seemed to have achieved a proper pace. Ah yes, five jewels and the second prince of the Golden Cliffs. Now there was the latter days of the Great Migration. The flight second blinked in astonishment for a moment and then shook his head. Triclick had always been a bit of an odd one, but now he was going to explain this in his report. One didn't just upend two decades of xenopsychology research with a field note saying, uh, and they like petting furry things. End of story. Story number three. Humans are weird. Report. Written by Betty Adams. Report from nutritional anthropologist Kulch to Home Swarm University regarding human survival rates as it relates to diet. Dearest colleagues, I am ever grateful for your kind communications and support. I have compiled and collated data and attached it to overview for your perusal. Let me say first and foremost that the rumors that I sent to investigate, i.e. that humans were in the first observed truly omnivorous species, have turned out to be a gross understatement. It is not simply that humans can eat both vegetable flesh and animal flesh, not even that they can eat anything in between, but seriously, they eat everything, regardless of its inherent nutritional value or risk factor. Indeed, this increases their odds of survival, but from the intellectual and interaction standpoint, it is just a little weird and creepy. Let's be honest. That, it seems like their first thought when encountering something new that isn't a rock is, uh, can I eat this? Mostly, they prefer plant matter as, uh, thank whatever deity you will, they seem to be squeamish about eating sentient beings, and the odds favor the plants won't be. It has also come to my attention that our particular eight-legged and multi-eyed form added to our chitinous outer membrane are particularly unappetizing to them across the multiculture. This is reassuring, but hardly a firm deterrent, as they have an instinct set that drives them to make digestible anything that isn't inherently. The nutrients are trapped in an unusable form. No worries. The human just finds something combustible, builds a fire, and heats it until it is indistinguishable fibers or whatever releases the nutrients. 
As the edible but protected by spikes, spines, and thorns, they might just grab a rock and beat it until the edible bit is available. They carry around vats of acid just in case they need to add it to the mix to denature large proteins. I kid you not, they have hundreds, hundreds of different species of microbes on their skin, in their mouth, in their digestive tracts that help them break down what their own systems won't. If nutrients are contaminated with unfriendly microorganisms, they count on friendly microfauna, as they call it, to fight them off. For aiding that, they have developed an entire subculture devoted to brewing poison of just the correct potency that kills the introducing microorganisms while leaving them alive. And if there is no plant matter that they can eat, they'll just find a, hopefully, non-sentient species that can break it down for them and wring out the proteins and nutrients out of them in ways that don't bear mentioning. See appendages, eggs, milk, and meat. It has been reported, if you can believe it, and with humans, why not, that on their own planet, in an ocean that is full of fish that they can eat with no processing at all, there is one species that is particularly poisonous to humans. Instead of avoiding it and eating the swarming fish species that are so benign that they can be eaten without even a basic heating, humans pay to have a specialist in food preparation known as a chef go through a complicated ritual to remove the deadly toxin. They will do this even when the non-toxic fish flesh is readily and far more cheaply available. Then, when they have enough nutrients, they will masticate whatever inorganic substance is at hand in some odd, seemingly unconscious ritual. The humans I've encountered seem to have a preference for writing utensils for this purpose. I hope that the information that I have gathered will prove useful. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.